Well, hello and welcome. You're watching News Center with me, Ashmit Kumar. Now, Thales, a leading French aerospace and defense supplier, is present uh, at Paris in France at the AI Action Summit. Now, a key supplier of critical defense systems, Thales is also looking to integrate the latest in AI for increased efficiency and capabilities of its defense system. So what does a future with AI look like? What does a future with AI and India look like? Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by Mr. Philippe Carrier. He's the Senior Executive Vice President for Research and Technology at Thales. Mr. Carrier, thank you so much for taking our time, for speaking to us uh, all the way from France. Uh, first question, AI is clearly the buzzword. We're, we've all been discussing it, uh, especially uh, in the first couple of days, first couple of weeks of 2025. A lot of excitement there. Uh, give us a picture for the benefit of our viewers. When we talk of integration of AI into defense system, what does that future look like from a Thales perspective? Yes, so good uh, good afternoon. And uh, yes, uh, definitely AI has, uh, has an immense potential, has an immense potential in uh, different uh, industries and markets. Uh, what is very interesting, though, is that we have seen an excitement around uh, investments in AI uh, since uh, about a year ago and accelerating uh, early 2025. But as a matter of fact, when you look uh, the type of AI that Thales is dealing with in the vertical markets in which we are operating, which are really AI for critical systems, is something very different. It's not the AI of GAFAMS, it's really the AI which has to be trusted, which has to be frugal, and which has to be transparent, and which has to be cyber secured. And this is at those conditions that we can introduce AI into systems like defense systems, like aeronautics, like space or uh, even in cybersecurity. Uh, give us a few examples, a few use cases uh, of integration of this AI technology with a weapon system, uh, and especially in an Indian context, from an Indian purchase order standpoint, uh, something an Indian uh, arms manufacturer or the Indian Army or the armed forces would perhaps be interested in. Give us a case study, an example to demonstrate uh, the integration of this technology and then the subsequent increase in efficiency. Yes, so... You can you can use AI at uh, in different elements of uh, of defense systems. Uh, first, you can use AI in what we call sensors. And what is a sensor? It's basically a radar. This is uh, I would say uh, an optronic pod as an example. Uh, it can be a sonar in submarines. Uh, or it can be uh, electronic warfare sensors. And what oh, oh, this specific AI that we may integrate inside the sensor gives the potential to augment significantly the capability of a sensor. Let me take a few examples. If you start putting AI inside a pod that you put on a, on a jet fighter, then as a matter of fact, it means that you can uh, really uh, analyze images in real time rather than having to wait in order to, to treat them offline. And this is basically increasing the tempo of a mission by a factor 100. Uh, another example, uh, if, you, if you take uh, radars for, um, uh, for air defense, uh, we all know that uh, a, a very common threat those days is drones. Uh, and what is a drone? It's basically a very small element which is flying at a low speed and at a low altitude. And radars are not very well done, well, well done to, to do this. We can do radars which can look really further and to, to also, uh, let's say, uh, be able to detect this type of things. But mm -hmm. in fact, by detecting those, fine, those kind of things, it looks like birds. And therefore, discriminating between birds and roads is something very, very important. And thanks to AI, we can definitely augment the capabilities of those radars. These are a few examples. I could take examples as well in classification of mines for mine warfare. These are the different elements where we are introducing AI in all our systems. And we have today in the Thales portfolio around 150 products which are introducing or in the process of introducing AI in, a, in their capabilities. Wonderful. Uh, let me also bring in an aspect, an, an aspect that uh, the French president, Mr. Emmanuel Macron, had touched upon. Uh, the, the concept of integration of AI with uh, the critical technologies, critical defense technologies, uh, brings in the co concept of uh, trusted sources, brings in the concept of reliability, security. Uh, 
And herein, I want to draw from the comments that uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron had made about technology sovereignty. Uh, I just want to get a sense, what does technology sovereignty mean in perspective of AI and integration of AI with uh, defense technologies? Developing one's own AI is clearly a focus area for not just France, but also for India. Yes, I think this is a, this is a, a, a fantastic topic because AI uh, introducing a, a completely new paradigm. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it's about sovereignty of a technology, but it's also about so sovereignty of the data sources. Because in fact, uh, with AI based on data, okay. you basically train your algorithms with data which is very often classified data. So as a matter of fact, it means not only that we need to uh, use uh, open source models or we can use uh, local models or local algorithms which are sovereign algorithms, but then we, you need also to be able to train locally your algorithms with the classified data of the different countries in which we operate. This is a, this is a very important element uh, related to AI, and I do think that really India and France have a lot in common in the thinking process about thinking about sovereignty, about localization, about the capability of developing both algorithms, but also training via the, the algorithms locally. Sure. Uh let me then ask you the next logical question is that when we talk of uh, integration of the two worlds, one of technology, AI, and the other of defense, uh, what does that do to the conversation about regulation? Does that heighten the need for perhaps a common, consistent regulatory framework uh, to ensure that there is some degree of oversight and governance as far as uh, defense technologies enabled with AI is concerned? Yes, yeah, so, so, so in, in fact, we... We really need to look at the at the different verticals in which we operate. Uh, I do think that uh, introducing AI in aeronautics is going to be in a very regulated environment because at a point of time we need certification and this will be given by the uh, regulation bodies like EASA in Europe uh, and the and the different bodies. Uh, allowing to introduce AI and under which conditions in, in systems. Uh, when it comes to defense, it it really comes as well about uh, what do we allow and what do we want to do with AI? And in particular, having a framework of what I would call the doctrine of using AI into different systems is absolutely essential. Uh, I do think again there we have a lot we have a lot in common because in defense, what we want is really always a human in control of the AI. And this is absolutely essential because uh, we want, when we introduce AI in autonomous systems, as an example, that at any time the AI operates within the boundaries of what we have given as a contract to the AI, and at any time a human is able to take control of it. Uh, my next question, Mr. Carrier, is with respect to looking at India uh, from a technology partner standpoint. I just want to get a sense there. Uh, India has a couple of things working for it. It has large data sets uh, available to it of both personal and non-personal data. Uh, it has a huge, a vast pool of talent there as well. Uh, so when we're looking at, de at developing uh, such technologies, AI for defense systems, uh, is there room for collaboration? Could we see perhaps uh, an innovation center that Thales could look uh, for developing here in India? Could we see a greater deployment here? There are, you mentioned already 2,000 engineers. Uh, could we see a widening of that footprint, perhaps more investments uh, towards developing, co-developing uh, such technologies? Yes, so, so when when you look, uh, yes, uh, and, and maybe it's not going to be something which is broad because AI is a very vast domain. domain. But uh, if you look to, to our presence, uh, Thales presence in, uh, in India, this is already quite significant. Uh, we have uh, two large engineering centers, one in Noida with uh, more than 1,000 employees and uh, really focusing on, on cyber and digital technologies and another one in, uh, in Bangalore, uh, working more on our aeronautics and defense uh, and defense topics. And what is very interesting is that in India, we can bridge the two. 
because AI is about digital. It is also opening in AI a new front, which is how do we cyber secure AI and how do we use AI for our cyber security products. And this is definitely an area in which we are already working and already working in India, in our team in, in Noida, and we can expand from there. So yes, to answer to your question, there is definitely a potential to widen the, co the cooperation and to continue uh, using the capabilities we have in digital to further introduce AI as well in India in our other products, whether it's aeronautics or defense. Right, Mr. Kerry, my final question, and I'll just borrow from some recent conversations uh, that I've seen between the Indian Technology Minister and Sam Altman, who was here very recently. Uh, the conversation post Deep Seek is about bringing in more efficiencies, bringing in more cost efficiencies, uh, to be more specific. Uh, I just want to get your sense, just get, getting your thoughts, uh, that when you look ahead at 2025, uh, after the Deep Seek disruption, what are your expectations from the AI Action Summit and as uh, the 2025 year progresses with the focus now on cost efficiencies? Is that the focus? Is that uh, the way that we could see perhaps a democratization of this technology, more such uh, models coming up, more such technology uh, coming up from the startup innovation ecosystem? Yes, so, but, but again, what I would do is I would differentiate, differentiate between two types of AI. There is one which is really working on LLMs, on large models. And here, what we will see, and you're absolutely right, is we will see different variants of those LLMs. And uh, what we will do, we will see also is uh, open source models or new companies working on smaller set of data. And rather than doing a model which does everything, then you can have specialized models for dedicated applications. And this is also a way to uh, minimize energy consumption, to use less power, and to be more cost efficient. Uh, this is one domain of AI, which is the large language models type of thing. Uh, the other element on which we are extensively working in Thales is the type of frugal AI that we need to have in our verticals, because this is an AI that you need to embed directly inside the systems. And here it's about transparency, it's about ethics, it's about frugality, and it's about cybersecurity. Right, Mr. Kerrier, thank you so much for joining us and sharing those perspectives for the benefit of our viewers. Exciting times, this is an exciting year, 2025, when you're looking at uh, technologies, emerging tech such as AI and what it could do for in terms of securing uh, our border, securing our airspace in terms of defense systems and their capabilities. Mr. Uh, Kerrier, thank you so much for joining us all the way from uh, Paris, from France, uh, for throwing more light on the uh, AI Action Summit all the way from France. Mr. Kerrier, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Well, that, of course, was Philip Carrier from Thales, all the way from France. But we'll continue our focus on AI and specifically uh, the AI Action Summit in France. We have Charlotte Sharma, the co-founder of iSpirit, joining us on the other side of this short break. Stay with us. <laughs>